Before we begin, this video is sponsored by Vezi. When I'm cold and wet, I become severely miserable and demotivated. I take it to heart and my day is ruined. However, the reality is not only do I have places to be, but the irony is fresh air has a reinvigorating quality to overcome said misery and demotivation. So how do I solve said paradox, you ask? Well, with the power of Vezi. You see, I don't like dressing in heavy coats and shoes like it's a set of armor because it just makes me feel restricted and uncomfortable, thus creating a whole different problem. So the beauty of the Vezi, in particular their overcast jacket and Ulta high top sneakers, is that they provide all the benefits of heat insulation, 100% waterproof design and sturdy reliability, but with a soft, seamless, lightweight feel and fit, so being protected in grim climate conditions don't interfere with simply being leisurely and relaxed. Also, the overcast jacket just looks slick and pairs well with Vezi's waterproof soft interior touchscreen compatible gloves, and even my own personal aesthetic, which isn't the easiest of holy grails to pull off. It's as much of a mental comfort as it is physical. For example, Ulta high tops are perfect for the unpredictable winter because they provide extra sheltering for sudden snow, slush, water and mud, and have tire-like traction on the outsole to give you greater confidence on slippery, ever-changing surfaces. So this holiday season, why not get in on the Vezi magic? Because Vezi is not just for Christmas, it's for life. And I mean that literally because, like myself, you'll be wearing their gear all year round. Simply go to Vezi.com slash Ryan Hollinger and treat yourself and your loved ones to a wide range of wares and get 15% off your first order, and in doing so, you'll be greatly supporting my channel. If you've been subscribed to my channel long enough, you'll know I have an affinity for schlocky early to mid 2000s horrors and thrillers. However, there is one film that is downright awful and has eluded me for the better part of 15 years. So, to celebrate the holidays, let's take our strongest Christmas liquor and drown our sorrows in a serious Jim Carrey flick. Welcome to the number 23. The number 23 tells the story of a timid dog catcher called Walter Sparrow, who is gifted with a mysterious book by his wife Agatha on his birthday that not only seems to reflect obscure events from Walter's life, but causes him to become increasingly obsessed with the enigmatic number 23, which has indirectly claimed the lives of several people. Yep, that's the threat, an evil number that drives people to off themselves when they can't stop seeing it in every facet of their lives. And look, I'm not going to say it isn't at least a conceptually alluring premise. Numbers can be pretty scary when it comes to tax season or checking your own bank accounts, but my god, I have never seen a film so desperately go out of its way to convince you that this is a tangibly horrifying idea. The film gets things going with a Saul Bass Hitchcockian inspired opening title sequence that perfectly conveys the melodramatic tone of the story by showing off a few egregiously selective examples of the 23 Enigma, along with blood splatter to foreshadow the deathly consequences. To give you a taste of how utterly nonsensical and inconsistent the logic of the supposed 23 enigma is, here's a few of the intro's examples. <clears throat> Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times, the Latin alphabet has 23 letters because Latin is basically a demonic language in horror films, Hiroshima was bombed August 6, 1945, 8 plus 6 plus 1 plus 9, 4 and 5 equals 23, Titanic sank April 15, 1912, 4 plus 1 plus 5 and so on adds up to 23, Hitler shot himself April 1945, that gets you 23, but unlike the Titanic, we ignore the specific day in this instance because it contradicts our equation. Charles Manson was born November 12th, so 11 plus 12 equals 23. It's spooky because Manson was an evil bastard, but notice how we're suddenly allowed to just group numbers together to fit the math. We're even ignoring the year in this case because him being born in 1934 doesn't mathematically validate any of our suspicions. The Mayans thought the world would end on December 23rd, 2012. That's a very selective day because there were numerous predictions on the precise day around that time, but even then, if you add 21 and 2, you get 23, but that's a very conveniently selective 20, may I say. One could argue it should be 2 plus 0 plus 1 plus 2, which is 5 if we're playing by any sort of consistent fucking logic. And lastly, Shakespeare was born and died on April 23rd. What the hell does Shakespeare have to do with this? Look, I get trying to connect the number to deadly and tragic circumstances to really hype its cursed presence, but this is easily the most audaciously stupid example of selective, out-of-context misinformation to sell a mild conspiracy. And what's unsurprising in today's landscape of false news is that people will genuinely buy into this shit. Hell, Kerry's own questionable beliefs make him the exact candidate to buy into this crap. 
In fact, one glance at the Wikipedia tells you this. Jim Carrey told reporters he was so captivated by the 23 Enigma even before reading the script that he renamed his production company from Pitbull Productions to JC23. Oddly enough, the first film Carrey worked on with Joel Schumacher, his character the Riddler's real name was Enigma. According to Carrey, he was reading a book about Sam 23 when he was first given a copy of the screenplay to review. You see, this is the kind of crap that proves my point. Carrey's behavior during filming was reportedly bizarre and upsetting to others on set. Radar cited a source that told them that during filming, Carrey unzipped his fly and urinated as part of his improvisation. Everyone was horrified. What the hell am I supposed to do with that information? Now, if I'm to give the number 23 credit for anything before we give it a tragic bollocking, I do think the raw narrative ingredients are there to show its potential deep down in the depths of hell. Our story begins on February 3rd because 23, where we're introduced to Walter reminiscing on his seemingly dissatisfying life. Life, when he's called to apprehend a strange dog that attacks him and leads him to the mysterious grave of Laura Tollins. Keep this in mind because it'll be relevant later as confirmed by this sudden gust of spooky wind right on cue. We get Jim Carrey mimicking his soft-spoken eternal sunshine of a spotless mind narration but without the sincere sentimentality as he existentially ruminates on the sense of displacement as though he's a mismatched character in someone else's story rather than someone with real control over his life. We see this in his rather passive relationship with those around him, and the fact that he visually looks out of place in his own job, heavily suggesting there's more behind the mask of this humble, generic protagonist. While I wouldn't call the film meta by any means, when Walter does eventually obtain the book, which by the way is written by Topsy Kretz, uh, Topsy Kretz, Topsy, oh no you're not. If I was to write a book, I wouldn't use a ridiculous name like Top Secrets. Oh Christ, you are. Okay, so here's the massive elephant in the room. This film famously got a thorough scathing by critics, but one thing that's worth acknowledging is that it seems self-aware of its own farce, to the point I honestly wonder if its serious tone and dramatic presentation is meant to be parody. Because the way it presents the book segments as a pulpy, semi-erotic, neo-noir 90s detective thriller written by a clearly delusional writer whose protagonist is a self insert suggests it might be going for its own version of House of Leaves. Joel Schumacher, which explains a lot already, was famous, or infamous depending on how you look at it, a bit of an aficionado of not playing by the rules of convention for both better and worse. For every Kiefer Sutherland in a mohawk, we got Bapulge. For every Michael Douglas meltdown, we got Jared Butler singing. The point is, Schumacher was never the most acclaimed filmmaker, he was always rough around the edges, but he certainly had a unique flair for theatrics, especially his work in the 90s. And so the number 23, his 20 the third film, to be exact, was right up his alley with its bizarre mix of camp and provocativeness. While making Walter seem out of place has its intended effect, I still think Jim Carrey is miscast in the role, as the tone feels more suited to Nicolas Cage to chew the scenery when you compare it with what he and Schumacher did with 8mm, about a timid man dragged into the seedy underbelly of snuff films where, similar to Walter's journey, it morally and psychologically tears him apart to the point he figuratively becomes two different people. In fact, Cage actually did a fairly similar film a few years later called Knowing, where he plays a man who discovers random numbers that indicate impending tragedies and disasters leading to the end of the world. Carrie is fine with what he does, he's a good dramatic actor, but he's ironically very restrained in a film that's arguably way more bonkers than some of Carrie's own early dark comedies. I'll be honest, I didn't get it. I asked her the only question I could muster. Any more coffee? Anyway, when Walter commences reading, the film takes on a partial second-person perspective, where Walter puts himself in the shoes of the book's protagonist Fingerling, a brooding, horny, Max Payne-esque detective who is stylized so comically over the top, despite Carrie's efforts to grind him in a reality that frankly makes no sense. Burning coffee grounds is an old trick cops use to take away the smell of death at a crime scene. 
but somebody had used all the coffee. Actually, who wrote this? Oh, no Wikipedia I see, I guess that makes us the lucky ones. The first few chapters summarise Fingerling's childhood through questionably jarring green screening and compositing as if it were a low-budget Tim Burton film designed to give you visual whiplash. I understand it might be going for a sort of montage-style storybook dreamscape aesthetic, but you almost forget you're supposed to be watching a serious thriller. However, to further give it the benefit of the doubt, my theory with the book segments is that it wanted to mimic the style of Sin City, which which released two years before it, because it's established that Fingerling's whole persona and by extension the inspiration of the author developed from his childhood love of pulpy detective magazines that Sin City drew from. With its emphasis on classical noir tropes, harsh lighting and distinct use of filters and colour motifs like blood red to symbolise the violence that plagues the world of the characters. I mean, outside the number 23 itself, don't worry it comes into the equation very shortly, the colour red literally bleeds into Walter's reality as it follows him just as constantly, insinuating his connection to the book before events even really begin. Walter immediately identifies with Fingerling's childhood, from small details like his obsession with detective comics, to the significant revelation of Fingerling discovering his dead neighbour as a child, who's described similarly to Walter's own mother. As a result, Fingerling grew up with a sort of paranoid psychosexual trauma that's enabled further by his s and relationship with a mysterious woman called Fabrizio whom Walter imagines in the image of Agatha. It's an element that's very loosely foreshadowed in a random opening flashback of Walter avoiding the advances of a co-worker at a Christmas party that alludes to a thematic undercurrent of misogyny and sexual repression. Oh yeah, I should probably say, you'll see Fingerling randomly playing a saxophone in certain scenes to calm his nerves. There's an insignificant reason given for it, but like I was saying earlier regarding the pulpy style of detective comics, in such aggressively brooding scenes, where you're supposed to take it seriously, there's no way I cannot see this as intentional farce. The number finally enters the equation when Fingerling is called to a hotel room to help a woman simply referred to as Suicide Blonde, who reveals her obsession with the number 23, and after calming her down and leaving, she lives up to her name while Fingerling poses like he's on the cover of fucking Darkman. From this point onwards, both Walter and Fingerling become as equally obsessed with the number 23, as if it latches itself onto them like a demonic presence, yet frankly I was more scared of how everyone just suddenly got shit hot at math because while Agatha tries to rationalise it as coincidental and selective like I did, Walter's son Robin wastes no time enabling his father's paranoia. 14 is 1 plus 4 which equals 5 and 5 plus 18 is 23 too. Oh my god. Shut up! 18 plus 14 is 32. 23 reversed. No, 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 you don't just get to, like, flip numbers and make your own rules all willy-nilly, because in that case, every time you say something is 23, I could argue it's actually 32 reversed. Things take a sinister turn when Walter starts having nightmares about murdering Agatha after reading about Fingerling and Fabrizia's murder roleplay, and it's here where the film lingers on this superstitious deadly sins theme as Fingerling indulges in his lustful fantasies with his big red dragon style tattoo. It wholeheartedly loves indulging in the illusion of being some psychologically complex character study, but I actually think this style over substance approach appropriately fits the delusional narcissistic psyche of Fingerling and the author. As you'll quickly learn, Topsy Kretz, god I can't believe I had to say it again, is no Stephen King or professional writer in any capacity. The book is essentially a psychotic scrappy memoir that Walter soon suspects is a murder confession when Fabrizia is stabbed to death by Fingerling after he assumes she's having an affair with his psychologist Dr. Phoenix, whom Fingerling then frames. And what's significant about this is that it perfectly mirrors the murder of a college girl called Laura. Laura Tollins. Told you that grave would come back to haunt us. In keeping with the duality between Walter and Fingerling, Walter even frames Dr. Phoenix as Agatha's best mate Isaac, who Walter shows jealousy towards, even suspecting a possible affair. As such, Walter's paranoia grows worse, and he eventually tracks down the hotel room of the blonde girl described in the book, where the story just sort of ends after Fingerling seemingly meets the same fate as the blonde girl, after his own obsession with the number 23 led him back to the 
very same hotel room. The thing is, most of the plot developments are essentially Deus Ex Machina's. It doesn't naturally justify how the timelines intercept one another. In fact, despite the emphasis on the number 23, it has very little bearing on the story itself, outside being this abstract symbol for the devastating effects of paranoia and obsession. You could replace the number with literally anything and it would change nothing about the story. I guess it works in the sense that it's like the banality of evil where such an insignificant thing ends up with so much power over something more tangibly superstitious like pareidolia where you think you see faces and everything. From the third act onwards, there are more twists than Shyamalan could handle. After Walter encounters the dog that bit him again, he chases it back to Laura Tolan's grave and discovers its name Ned adds up to 23. The local priest even claims that Ned's name apparently means guardian of the dead, which seems to suggest not only a supernatural quality to the dog, but that Laura's spirit seeks closure and retribution for her murder, as firstly her body was never found, her grave is simply a marker, and secondly the man convicted of her murder, Cal Flinch, couldn't have done it because I swear to god, when Walter confronts him in prison his name does not add up to 23. That said, one rather unusual positive is that Mark Pellegrino's very short scene as the wrongfully convicted man feels like like it's from an entirely different film. It's a rather powerful monologue about his family falling apart and losing hope because they couldn't overturn his conviction, eventually accepting that maybe he just was the killer and now refused to visit him. It's interesting because he pretty much mocks the entire conceit of the film to call attention to the fact that this innocent man's life has been ruined and all Walter cares about is this silly obsession as to why he is the subject of the story, but it's based entirely on his own reading of the material. Flinch doesn't have to to say it, Walter is basically projecting. His own delusions and narcissism are beginning to show through the cracks, but before it can mold anything interesting out of this in the way of nuance, we get another silly deus ex machina where Robin discovers a hidden postal address within the book indicating Topsy Kret's location, and to flex their ha gotcha arrival, they send him 23 boxes of packaging peanuts because… 23, bitch! The guy whose name is revealed as Dr. Sirius Leary. <laughs> seriously. Yeah, no, I, I've. No, I won't. No. He then cuts his throat after Walter tries to interrogate him, leading Agatha to an abandoned psychiatric hospital where Leary worked, while another Deus Ex Machina sees Walter find a hidden address out of every 23rd letter in the book, leading him and Robin to the unmarked grave of Laura Tollins. But wait, someone is watching. After returning with the police, Laura's skeletal remains have vanished, only for Walter to then discover Agatha was the one to move the skeleton for a reason that does not change justify the crime she's now committed. After some back and forth efforts at misdirection, Agatha finally reveals that Walter is Topsy Kretz. Oh my god, if you didn't work that out immediately from the beginning, uh, just go back and watch the film and you will see many unsubtle giveaways throughout that Walter obviously wrote the book. The explanation, however, is pretty convoluted, and some details do remain obscure to play off the whole paranoid delusion angle, but let me do my best to explain it. After refusing to believe Agatha and running from the truth, Walter returns to the hotel of where Blondie and Fingerling supposedly died, and discovers that the missing final chapters of the book are written beneath the covered walls of the hotel room, revealing that Walter and Fingerling are the same person. As a child, Walter witnessed his own father shoot himself among his dead mother, leaving behind a note that indicated his obsession with the number 23. Years later in college, Walter met Laura Tollins, but inherited the same obsession as his father that one day told him to kill her after she had an affair with her professor Kyle Flinch, who then took the fall. Walter then devised a sort <laughs> note, but morphed it into a more cryptic confession that only he could decipher. He forgot all this because he then jumped out a window, but miraculously survived and spent months recovering in a mental institution under the care of Dr. Leary, yeah that guy, and upon finally leaving he immediately bumped into Agatha and moved on with his life without her ever learning he went to that institution despite literally meeting him right outside of it. His manuscript, if you can call it that, ended up in the hands of Leary who then became the number's new victim, and eventually published it under the pseudonym Topsy Kretz, but that detail actually contradicts Walter mentioning his childhood neighbor's dog was called Chief, but his father 
used to call it mischief because it kept escaping, so it actually would make more sense that Walter would use such a shit pun for a name since he's effectively following in his father's footsteps, not this man of science. Anyway, upon accepting his past, Walter decides to stand in front of an oncoming bus, which can I just say has more than ample time to stop, yet for some reason doesn't, but before this maniac bus driver can hit him, he moves out of the way for the love of his family. He takes accountability, confesses to his crime, and awaits sentencing as Kyle Flinch is finally released, with one final ambiguous hint being that Walter may not have entirely overcome his obsession with the number 23. It's very on the nose with the idea that your past will literally come back to haunt you and you cannot run away from your guilt, as the book circles back into its owner's hands. That said, The Number 23 is one of the worst thrillers I've ever seen. Maybe one of the worst films I've seen, but that's trickier to decide. It's unforgettably forgettable, is the way I would describe it, in that you'll remember the essence of the film's weird little details, but never how any of it truly connects. So with that said, thank you so much for watching, thank you so much for sticking around this entire year. I wish you and your loved ones a very Merry Christmas and a prosperous new year. And so until next time, stay safe, stay away from the number 23, and hopefully I'll see you in 2024. Bye. Oh, my mom is going to kill me for using all her eyeliner.